Hey there, uh, I'm here to talk about our next topic and we've been talking about evolution and the ev evidence for evolution and we've talked a little bit about Darwin, we've talked a little bit about natural selection. Um, we want to spend this lecture just going into a little bit more details about natural selection and um, Darwin's, Darwin's thought process and some of the arguments that he made in support of this idea. Um, so let's do that. Let's get started. Okay, so Darwin thought that, you know, some organisms are just naturally better at surviving and reproducing in a given environment. And it's this idea of survival and reproduction together is what we call fitness. And so just surviving is not enough. The key is that you're also able to reproduce and pass your traits on to the next generation. That, you know, both are important to fitness and both are important to natural selection, but uh, survival without reproduction um, will not be acted upon by natural selection. So those that survive and reproduce can pass on their advantageous traits. And if this process occurs over a long time, you can get very different organisms. Um, so one of the arguments that he made, or one of the things that he pointed out, is that humans can make very different organisms through artificial selection. And so humans have been breeding organisms, um, you know, for millennia. And humans purposely take certain organisms and pick the ones that have the traits that they're looking for and breed those together. And then from their offspring, they pick the ones that have the traits they're looking for. And through doing this, you can get very different organisms. And that's called artificial selection because you're artificially selecting for certain traits. And so dog breeds are a classic example here, right? And so here we've got um, three different dog breeds and they're very different organisms but they all started from the same organisms they all started from humans taking the same ancestor and some humans decided hey you know we want a dog that has a good nose and that's good for hunting and so they just would take the puppies that were the best at, at hunting and had the best nose and breed them and then from their offspring they would breed the best hunters and in a pretty short time you've got something like a springer spaniel um, or you say well i want a hunting dog but i want it to be a retrieve you know i want it to really go out and get get ducks and it's going to be in a wet environment so i want puppies that have a a coat that does well in water and also likes to retrieve and so you artificially select for those traits in each litter of puppies and you can get a very different kind of breed of dog and you can get a labrador retriever or, or and so on and so forth and so agriculture is filled with all these examples of humans artificially selecting for traits and they're able to produce very different organisms. And so it shows that if you start with a common ancestor, by emphasizing certain traits, you can greatly change that organism. And with artificial selection, you can do that in a very short time. Well, if you could do that with artificial selection, Darwin asks, why can't you do that with natural selection? It just takes longer. You know, what this shows is that by selecting for certain traits, you can get a very different organism. And so just as a side note, what is the common ancestor of these three dogs? You know, where, where did humans start with when they started selecting for different traits? Um, you can look at a, a tree, something like this, and, and uh, the gray wolf um, might be considered uh, the starting point for a lot of these domestic dog breeds. And so you've got different traits of different uh, gray wolves that were selected by humans. And those traits were emphasized in different parts of the world for different reasons. And that's artificial selection, not natural selection. But you're aware of all the different dog breeds. You, you see that by artificially selecting for these traits, you 
can get very different dogs. Now, if humans aren't involved, you can still select for traits, but it's, it's based upon not what humans want, but upon their suitability to the current environment. And those that are best suited to the environment, those traits will be selected for. And that's natural selection. But if artificial selection can give you such different organisms, so can natural selection. It just takes longer. Now, as a side note to the side note, this is probably a better phylogenetic tree showing the ancestry of dogs and wolves. So if you look right there in the middle, you see that, that um, dogs and wolves um, have a recent common ancestor, and that's probably more accurate. So probably dogs are not just domesticated wolves. Dogs have a common ancestor with domesticated, or excuse me, that uh, dogs have a common ancestor with gray wolves. And so if you go back in time, there was, you know, a group of a wolf-like animal that wasn't really a wolf and groups of those became domesticated and that group those groups then became domesticated dogs whereas another group split off and over time became the modern wolf that's probably a more accurate um, uh, description of where dogs came from so they're not necessarily wolves that were domesticated they have a recent common ancestor with wolves okay and so again, taking and selecting for the traits that humans want, you're able to select and create a very different organism, and that's artificial selection. It works on a very short time scale. And so, you know, a lot of these uh, dog breeds only go back a few hundred years. That's a, not even a blink of an eye in evolutionary time. A few hundred years is no, nothing at all in the history of the Earth and, and in evolutionary history. So just in a few generations, you're able to get very different organisms with artificial selection. Natural selection works on a much longer time scale, but still you end up with very different organisms. And so an example I showed you earlier, again, if you start with this wild mustard plant and humans have purposely selected for different characteristics of this plant, and you end up in a short time with very different plants, you know, kale or broccoli or cabbage, but they're all the same species. If we can get such different organisms in a short time with artificial selection, Darwin argued, why can't we get similar diversity with natural selection over a, it just takes a longer time. And so that was part of Darwin's thinking. And so we like to take a look at Darwin's uh, logic and again you know he spelled out his argument in great detail and, and that's um, what took so long to write his book but also why people took it seriously and if you kind of look at or think about how he thought about it it really helps to um, understand the the idea of natural selection but really you see how the idea of natural selection logically follows from things that we know about the natural world so let's do that let's talk about that darwin had several observations you know he was a naturalist he liked to look at living things and he, he liked to study nature and so he would make observations about living things and then from these observations, he would draw some inferences. And that's how he developed this idea. So the first observation that Darwin would make is that members of a population vary in their inherited traits. And so if you study, you know, biology for about a half second, you see this is true that in any population of any type of organism, they're not all identical. You see lots of variability. And so if you look at this you know, population of ladybugs that's shown here, you can see that they're not all the same. There's, there's differences in sizes, there's differences in spot patterns. Now, you know, Darwin knew nothing about genetics or DNA or cells or we didn't know any of that when you know when when Darwin was coming up with this idea um, and so 
now that we can look at DNA, we see that, that there's a ridiculous amount of variation if we look at the DNA level. Darwin didn't know any of this, but just by observing organisms, he could tell, hey, these organisms are different. And, and the traits that they're different, you know, the things that are different about them are heritable, get passed on to their offspring. And so he noticed this. And so if you look at, at any kind of organism, um, within a species, within a population, there's lots of variability. So that's what you can see here. You know, again, here, if you look at organisms, lots of variability. And there's variability not just in how you look, you know, the number of spots or the color pattern, but in all kinds of traits. For example, like things like blooming time, right? So you're looking at these flowers here and some are blooming earlier and some are blooming later or some organisms are taller and some are shorter or some are faster or some digest carbohydrates better. Any trait, there's variability among individuals in a population and Darwin noticed this and, and saw this in everywhere he looked. And then he also noticed that those traits get passed on to their offspring. Those are heritable traits. And so um, one of the examples that he liked to use was uh, pigeon breeders. And it's just like our example that we gave earlier with dog breeders, is that Darwin said, hey, look, you know, pigeon breeders can get unique traits by breeding together parents with those traits. That pigeon breeders and all agricultural or any type of breeder realizes that Oh, if you bring the right two individuals together, they'll pass on the traits they have to their offspring. And so there's all these traits that vary, but you tend to have offspring that have the same traits that you do, or parents tend to pass their traits to their offspring. And so you can see that. And here's, here's uh, uh, my wife and I and our daughter, oh, that's an old picture. But again, you know, you, you know this, you, you can compare yourself to your parents. You can see that parents pass on traits to their offspring. And Darwin can see that. Now he had no idea what the mechanism was. Again, this is before we knew what cells were. This is way before we knew about chromosomes and DNA and all the sort of thing. Yet he could still tell that parents pass traits on to offspring. Now, here's a little another side note and it's something that um you know if you had biology before you, you've learned about gregor mendel so darwin didn't you know he knew that traits got passed between parents to their offspring he had no idea how gregor mendel was a monk and he used a, a scientific approach to try to figure out how these traits get passed and so a lot of the basic laws of heredity that we're aware of were discovered by Mendel. Um, and he did it through several different, using several different organisms, but he's most famously known for breeding peas. And um, peas are real easy to use in this kind of experiment. And, and by studying how traits get passed from one generation of peas to the next generation, he came up, he noticed some patterns, right? Here's the interesting thing. This was around the mid-1800s, around the 1850s. So right around the same time that Darwin was publishing his book. But neither of them knew about the other. That they had, you know, Darwin certainly didn't know anything about what Mendel was, was learning, and, and Mendel didn't know about Darwin. And it wasn't until 50 years later that anybody really discovered Mendel's work and then when realized, oh, what Mendel figured out helps to explain a lot of the things that Darwin was talking about, but they didn't know of each other. Um, and also Mendel figured out a lot of these laws of inheritance, but again, he didn't know anything about chromosomes or DNA or genes or any of those sorts of things. This, you know, he, but, but just by carefully looking at how traits get passed, he was able to figure out some of these laws of inheritance. And so here's um, uh, Mendel's the one looking at a, he's looking at a pea plant or something in this picture. But he was a monk and he used his time to study plants. And like I said, peas, he used peas because they're really uh, good for this sort of experiment. So what you can do is you can, um, you know, cut the, the sperm producing 
uh, organs off of one flower and then you can take pollen uh, from one flower and you can brush it on the other flower. So you can very carefully control which plant breeds with which other plant. And so that's what Mendel did and he kept really good records. And you know, got a short generation time, you can get a lot of offspring quickly, um, you know, plants don't run away, things like that. So these peas were a really good uh, study organism. And so he drew, he, he had all kinds of different types of peas from the shape of the pea to the color of the flower to the size of the flower. There's all kinds of traits that he would breed. He would cross these different phenotypes and then he would keep good records. And over time, he began to notice some patterns. And so, again, if you've had a biology class before, you've probably talked about these kind of experiments that he did. But he, what classic examples, he would have purple flowers and white flowers. He had plants that made white flowers and plants that made purple flowers. And these were what they call true breeding. And so his purple flower plants when he bred them together, they always, always, always gave purple flowers. And his white flower plants, when he bred them together, they always, always, always gave white flowers. So then he crossed the purple and the white and found out that all the offspring had purple flowers. So that's interesting, right? There's no white flowers at all in that first generation, what we call the F1 generation. And so then he would take that F1 generation that the first generation and he would cross them amongst themselves he would breed them together so they're all purple flowers he'd breed them together and in what we call the f2 generation that white flower would pop up and it would it would always be in a ratio of about three to one roughly and so whereas with his parental his original purple flowers when you bred them they always gave purple flowers. But this F1 generation had purple flowers, and when you bred them, you know, a fourth of them would be white. That's really cool. And he thought, you know, studied that and found that, you know, a lot of traits would follow this rule. This may not seem like a big deal to you, but that's a big deal, right? Because the white flowers disappeared in one generation, and then they reappeared in another generation. And so this answered a big question. Um, you know, this means that traits don't necessarily blend together. That traits are, are the result of discrete units of inheritance. And so if they blended together, then they would just always mix and you would lose the original traits. But this showed the original traits stuck around and they just got masked. And so what this means is some of those F1 plants must carry that original trait. You can't see it, but it must still be there and it gets passed on to the F2s. That's how those white flowers are able to show up in that F2 generation. And again, Mendel, uh, you know, he didn't know. They, they knew nothing about cells at the time or DNA or anything, but now we know why this works, right? Because all plants carry two copies of the flower color gene and you've got different alleles for that gene, right? Some alleles make purple flowers and some alleles make white flowers. The purple allele is dominant to the white allele. And so plants can have a purple allele and a white allele, but they'll have purple flowers because that purple allele is dominant. But they, ha they still carry that white allele and can pass it on to their offspring. And so that's what, you know, they're carriers of that white allele. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, so Mendel <coughs> was figuring out all these laws of inheritance. Darwin didn't know any of this. Um, and so this is what we're showing, how, again, how the purple allele is dominant to the white allele. But his Mendel's work confirmed Darwin's observations that traits can get passed from parents to offspring. Um... But again, it was decades, it was 50 years before anybody really even uh, discovered or read or, or, or realized that Mendel had done all this work. And, and once people began to look at that, they realized how 
well that helped support Darwin's work. And it was, of course, you know, another 50 years before we figured out the structure of DNA and this idea that DNA makes RNA, makes protein, and, and so, you know, all the stuff that we've been talking about in class, um, they didn't know any of this stuff. But every time we learn a little bit more, it just helps to explain what Darwin, you know, that, uh, what Darwin was saying, and it helps to support what Darwin was saying. Okay, so back to Darwin now. So another thing that Darwin observed about living things, and, and anybody who st studies biology for half a second will also observe the same thing. All species produce more offspring than can be expected to survive. So all species, any type of organism, produces tons of offspring, way more than the environment can support. And so many offspring are born to die. Many, if not most, offspring will die before they reproduce. And that's true across all taxa. And so if you look at this mold giving off spores here, all those little dust-like particles. Every one of those is a spore. Every one of those is a potential new plant, right? This is one plant producing, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of potential offspring. If you look at an ear of corn, every single kernel is a seed, is a potential new corn plant. And on every corn plant, you've got many of these ears and they have many of these seeds, right? There's no way that all of these seeds can be expected to survive. The plant, the corn plant over reproduces. This is a fish. This is called a, a moon eye. And I've removed uh, one fillet off this fish and see all these little white dots, that's one ovary. Every one of those is an egg is a potential new fish, and that's one ovary, and on the other side, you've got a whole other ovary like this. So this is one fish who potentially could have thousands of babies, and that's true if you look at any fish species. You know, some of these uh, carp that we're trying to get out of Kentucky Lake, one female could have a million eggs. And you see this everywhere in biology, that organisms produce way more offspring than can be expected to survive. And you say, well, you know, yeah, you can cherry pick, you know, fish and, and some plants here, but is it true for all offspring? And so Darwin made the argument. He said, okay, well, let's do this. Let's take the organism that is the slowest reproducer. Let's, let, let's not cherry pick corn and fish. Let's take something that we know does not reproduce very quickly. And, and is this fact true for them? So let's take elephants. And so if you look at an elephant, uh, you know, an elephant that, that on average lives 90 years, and a female elephant's going to have about six calves in her 90-year lifetime on average. Half of those are going to be female. And so half of the, you know, so those females are also going to have about six calves in their 90-year lifetime. And so Darwin did the math, and you can do the math, and you can see that from that just one pair of elephants, because the generations overlap and because, you know, the, the female has some females and then those females have females and those, you know, in, in three generations, you're like those two become 54. And very quickly, if all elephants survived, the world would be covered in elephants. And, and there's lots of ways you can do this math. And it's true for humans. It's true for all organisms on Earth. And so even elephants or humans that don't seem to have a lot of organisms at once if you realize that that you know you could have babies and then pretty soon your babies will start having babies and their babies will start having babies and the, the generations can overlap again you can have a huge number of offspring way more than can be expected to survive and so darwin kind of put these these things together that are that are obviously true if you study biology and he was able to draw an inference from them he says look there's lots of variation in organisms and 
a lot of that is heritable. So a lot of that variation gets passed on to offsprings. So there's lots of variability that gets passed on to offsprings. And there's way, way more offspring that are than, than can be expected to survive. And so only, you know, only a few organisms survive. And so he said, look, individuals who inherit the traits that, you know, that allowed their parents to have an advantage are more likely to survive and are more likely to reproduce. And then they're going to pass their, you know, they're going to leave more offspring than other individuals. Put another way is that who survives is not random. And so only a few organisms survive each generation, but it's not random who survives. It's those who got traits from their parents that make them well suited for a particular environment. So if you put all these ideas together, this is the inference you come up with. And so you look at these ladybugs, there's lots of variability. That variability can be passed on to offspring. Only some of these ladybugs are going to be able to survive long enough and reproduce successfully. Is it random which ones survive and reproduce? No, those that are best suited are more likely to survive and reproduce. In this example we have with the bugs, right? There's variability in bug color. There's way more bugs than can survive the environment. So only some of these bugs are going to survive and reproduce. Is it random? Which ones are going to survive and reproduce? No, it is not. Some are born better suited to this environment and they're more likely to survive because they're camouflaged. And then they're more, if they're more likely to survive, then they're probably going to reproduce and they can pass on those traits to their offspring. We've got all these flowers here, right? Way more, you know, there's no way all these flowers are going to reproduce and have offspring. Cannot, the environment can't support it. Only some of these flowers are going to survive and produce offspring. Is it random which ones survive? No, it's those that are born best suited to this environment. So, we say it's not random which ones survive and which ones reproduce, right? There is some randomness to evolution, and sometimes people criticize evolution and criticize natural selection because they say well, it's a random process. How can you have have something that that leads to all this diversity if it's a random process? Well, it's not a random process. Survival and reproduction is not random. But how do we get all that variability? Where do we get all the different colors of petal or all the different spots or some bloom earlier and some bloom later. Where does that variability come from? Well, from different alleles, right? This is all genetic. Alleles are different forms of the same gene. And so if you have differences in characteristics, it's because you have differences in alleles. Where do alleles come from? Alleles come from mutation. So we get those different alleles because of random mutations of the DNA. Mutations are random. Mutations just happen when they happen. Most of the time the mutations are bad. Some of the times the mutations don't do anything. Every once in a while the mutations are beneficial. And so we get these new traits by random mutation. So there is randomness involved in this process. So those mutations occur randomly. But who survives and who reproduces is not random. And so if people dismiss evolution by saying, well, you know, something that's random can't, can't possibly um, be so important, well, it's not true. The mutations, the formation of new alleles, yes, that is random. But which alleles give the traits that give an organism an advantage, that is not random. Who survives and reproduces is not random. Okay, so now Darwin said, look, if this is all, you know, this, this is what I think. You've got all, the, uh, all these organisms and they're different and only some survive and, and it's not going to be random who survives. Well, if that process goes on for a long time, favorable traits will tend to accumulate. 
over time those traits that are not as good will tend to disappear because the organisms who have them will die. And so what's left will be traits that are favorable and you'll tend to accumulate those traits. And so, you know, in giraffes, you've got variation in, in necks, some a little shorter, some a little longer. Those that had the longer necks, more of them survived and their offspring had slightly longer necks, but their offspring had some variability. And so, and their offspring, some had a little bit longer, some had a little bit shorter. And so again, because the food supply was so high, those that had a little bit longer neck were more likely to survive. And so those unfavorable traits, the shorter necks, tended to not survive and disappear. Over time, the only thing left are those that are well suited for this environment. And those were gi giraffes with a very long neck. And so, uh, again, another way to think about this is natural selection is like a sieve. And, you know, it, it just it retains those characteristics that are favorable and the others that aren't favorable tend to disappear. And so it favors individuals whose characteristics give them an advantage in a particular environment at a particular time. And we like to make this point because people tend to think that, oh, natural selection means that organisms are just going to get better and better and more and more complicated. And that's not true. There's no goal or objective. Natural selection just exists in the present. You know, there's no way to predict what the environment's going to be like in the future. And so in the present, in the present environment, some are better adapted than others, right? There's variability out there. And the better adapted tend to survive better and leave more offspring. And since that variability is irritable, their offspring will also be well adapted. And so over time, you can get organisms that are very well adapted for an environment because those favorable traits will accumulate. And so you can see this uh, amazing camouflage that you can see here. And you can see, you know, in a different environment, you've got this organism that's well adapted to this environment. But it, that's for a given environment. If the environment changes, then different traits will be favored and, and an organism will change and those that are those that are best suited for this new environment are more likely to stick around but there's no goal organisms don't just get better and better because environments change and so what happens when the environment changes let's let's look at uh, an example from your book about how characteristics change when the environment changes and so this is the result of some classic studies that were done uh, on the Galapagos Islands. Um, uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant were a, a, a couple that have studied the Galapagos and birds in particular on the, uh, on the Galapagos uh, for, for decades. And so what you're looking at from this figure from your book is a distribution of bill size that they found in these finches on one island. And so you see that what we're graphing is the number of individuals at each bill depth. So if you look on the x-axis, the bottom axis, you've got from 5 millimeters to 14 millimeters. And so you've got some birds that have a very shallow beak and some birds with a very deep beak. But the average was about 9.5 millimeters, right? And bill depth has a lot to do with how strong your your beak is okay and so you can see that you've got a distribution for 1976 and then you've got a distribution for a few years a couple years later in 1978 and you can see by the height of the graph here that there you know there was a lot of birds in 1976 and not nearly as many in 1978 well what happened in 1977 there was a severe drought so the environment changed and because there was a drought the plants didn't produce new seeds, so the food supply became very restricted. The only seeds that were available are really large, tough seeds. And so that's a, a radical change to the environment. Now, those birds that had that deeper beak could break open those tough seeds because the bigger beak gave them that 
ability, right? And so since the only food was those bigger seeds, if those that had the bigger beak were more likely to survive and more likely to reproduce, but of course their offspring also had that bigger beak because it's an irritable trait. And so you can see that after 1977, first off, the size of this graph, the, the height of the, the graph dropped dramatically, right? There's a whole lot of death, a whole lot of birds died, but it was not random which ones died. Those that couldn't eat those seeds were more likely to die. And so in 1978, the average size of the bill was bigger because the survivors after this drought were those that had that bigger bill. That's natural selection. Did each bird grow a deeper bill because they needed it? So did a bird realize, oh, I need a bigger bill to eat these seeds because that's the only food, so their bill grew bigger? No. Either they had a deeper bill or they didn't have a deeper bill. If you didn't have that deeper bill, you didn't get enough food and you probably died. And most of those died. And so the average bill depth became greater across all birds. And so the average size of the beak was bigger in 1978. The environment changed. It favored a different trait and the population changed. Again, individuals don't evolve, populations do. Individual birds did not grow bigger beaks. Those that had bigger beaks tended to stick around and the average size across the population got bigger. That's evolution. Okay, and so again, to summarize what Darwin was saying, that you've got individuals that vary in their irritable characteristics and there's lots of offspring, way more offspring that, that can be produced. And so only some organisms are going to survive, but it's not random who survives. Individuals that are well suited to their environment tend to leave more offspring than other individuals. And their offspring have those same characteristics. Over time, favorable traits tend to accumulate because the unfavorable traits tend to disappear as organisms with those traits die. That's natural selection. Okay, so uh, to jump back to something we talked about earlier and uh, Mendel's work, you know, Mendel's work supported Darwin's ideas. Darwin recognized that parents pass traits on to their offspring, um, but he didn't know how and he didn't really understand this process. But Mendel helped to explain that process. And so when people discovered Mendel's work, they realized how well that supported Darwin's work. And then as we learned more about molecular genetics, and we learned more about DNA and DNA to RNA to protein, that gave even more support to Darwin's work. And, and again, all these things could have contradicted Darwin's work, which would have called Darwin's idea into question and we would have had to come up with a better explanation for the origin of, of living things. But all these discoveries all supported Darwin's work and that's why we think that he's got the, the right idea. But when he started to pull together these genetic ideas, this molecular genetics with Darwin's ideas, that's called the um, modern synthesis. And so that, that was in the early um, 20th century. And so again, just how do these genetic ideas, why do they support Darwin so much? Think about the, the finches. You know, we said there's a range in the size, in the bill size, right? Why do we have, not everybody has the same bill depth. Why is that? Because of different alleles, right? There's different alleles for bill size. And so combinations of those alleles give you either a really small beak or a bigger beak, uh, a, a really big beak, but that's all determined genetically. But that's how that trait gets passed on to the offspring. And so, you know, you have mutations that create these new alleles. These new alleles can create new traits or you can get new combinations of traits. 
And so that's how you can create this variability that we see among organisms. And that's also how that variability, those traits get passed to the next generation. So the best combination of alleles are going to be the ones that are most likely to survive and reproduce. And so you see that in 1978, after the drought, you know, the average bill depth got greater, but there were still some birds that had extremely big bills. And had that drought continued, then the bills may have gotten even bigger and even bigger because only those organisms would be able to survive year after year of eating those big seeds. And over time, you might end up with a species of bird that has a very much, you know, whose bill is very much bigger, a very different trait. And so that's how over time, by selecting for certain traits, you could get a very different organism. And so like Darwin said, if we can get a radical change in traits with artificial selection, we can get a radical change in traits with natural selection. It just takes longer. Okay, so that's, uh, that's just a little bit more into Darwin's thinking. Um, hopefully this kind of maybe helps explain what we've been talking about a little bit more detail and certainly helps to tie together you know, Darwin's thinking with modern genetics. Um, so anyway, uh, I don't have any more to talk to you about right now. As always, let me know if you got any questions. And I'll see you later.